basically or mostly do political education work in, in Germany, but also have presence, uh, I could say, all over the world. The Adenauer Foundation has more than 70 offices abroad and uh, have projects in more than 120 countries. And as it happens, the Nordic countries, European Nordic countries, Scandinavia and uh, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, are covered from uh, our office in Riga, Latvia, which is, which is why I am here. And uh, when, uh, when pursuing projects uh, abroad, we, we do so in the, in the wish to, to contribute to, to promote of democracy, rule of law, and the social market economy in, in, in the countries in concern. And uh, our aim is, uh, in a way, to, to contribute to a world where uh, the individual can follow, follow uh, can pursue his or her goals um, in dignity and uh, live a life self-determined. And uh, I think from from the uh, from 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 this presentation, it will be clear why we have supported uh, this project and what it has to do with, with our values. And uh, just a short uh, administrative announcement, I would be very grateful if you could sign in these attendance lists uh, with your real or uh, made up name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it says address, doesn't have to be, it could be an email address, so just leave it blank and uh, sign in the, in the last column. Thanks in advance. This is one of the uh, administrative traditions in the German uh, law of grant making is that not only the number of attendees, but also th um, so there must be some sort of record of how many people attended events uh, for accounting and evaluation purposes. Um, Apart from YouTube records, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even there, you'll find a way. Anyway, thank you very much uh, for that. It's uh, always very good to have the funders uh, uh, present at uh, meetings like these. And with that, I ha give the word to Arne Riedel to tell us more about what the Arctic Summer College is doing and what brought us here. Arne. Thank you very much. And thanks, first of all, all of you for coming. Thank you, Ernest. And also, we have a guest of honor, the German ambassador here in Reykjavik. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and uh, what we're trying to do with this session, we have almost one and a half hours, a little, little over time, um, but um, we want to showcase what the Arctic Summer College can do, has been doing, and we would like to discuss later also what could be done more and how could we improve. Um, so we have three excellent fellows from this year's cohort, you'll see it's a range from experiences and the range from professions that we cover with the Arctic Summer College. And I think I can get a picture here. Gender bias. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try to have a sort of a sort of an even ground here. Can you just if you yeah, thank you. That's for the UX session. There we go. Um, so just talking about the Arctic Summer College objective, just to give you like a brief overview. Andreas Krem actually initiated at the Ecologic Institute. And we've been working uh, with this kind of program developing ever since since 2011. So we're on the sixth iteration actually, um, spreading the word, reaching out to partners, reaching out to funders, and and reaching out to more and more professions. So we are a research institute based in Berlin, focusing on policy advisory, focusing on research-based policy recommendations uh, in the environmental sphere. But of course, we need in the Arctic not just the environmental perspective per se, but also its connections to businesses, to civil societies, to resources, to, to a plethora of issues. So it's a policy-oriented network, that's where we're coming from, but it's also a platform for interdisciplinary knowledge. We want to broker knowledge between experts in the Arctic, uh, students in the Arctic, young professionals in the Arctic, to build a network that actually lasts. So I think my last update on Facebook was later, uh, earlier to th th today. And so we are proud to have by now like 104 people in this closed Facebook group contributing with their insights, exchanging views on active discussions, uh, on conferences, on opportunities to present, to publish, and to have an active exchange ongoing. So that's uh, over 100 people that we actually acquired to this network over the years. 
So the changes of the AC year over year, for, yeah. So we started off as an internal exchange to gather ecologics Arctic expertise, having worked for EU projects, Arctic Transform, Arctic Footprint. There was lots of knowledge in the Institute, but if you have over 70 re researchers uh, at Ecologic Institute, you need to exchange between those interdisciplinary um, rounds, basically. And so we have lawyers, economists, environmental scientists, wetland historians, so a range of people with expertise in Arctic issues. So th that's where it actually started from in 2011. But demand was big and partners knew about that. So uh, we opened it in 2012 as an external exchange. I actually participated myself for the first time in 2012 as an Arctic Summer College Fellow. So it was a mix of ecologic people and external starting in 2012. And the next steps in the next years, I mean, I won't bore you with all the details, but a big step forward was last year already when with the support of uh, WWF and Konrad Adenauer Foundation, we could expand in a, in a profound way um, that we actually were able to participate for the first time at the Arctic Circle Assembly here with a breakout session to share our ideas, our uh, fellows work with you and also to have individual submissions actually and, and ask our fellows to work on something in this eight week time frame of the Arctic Summer College. So um, this year we've been developing it even further having a split between the student program represented by Michaela today and our professional program by, represented by Carol and, and Mary. So it's, uh, it's, it's our idea to develop different streams of exchange for different levels. While we had a sort of unified program overall, having webinars with everybody participating, we also offered for the students additional webinars with additional content. So for more fostering the exchange among the students themselves. So that's sort of like a two stream that we started this year. And again, a mentoring program to, to have the exchange between the programs, actually people from the professional program supporting students. So. Um, what we did this year, so we get an overview, and it's the summer college because we actually start usually um, looking for fellows and, uh, and starting the program early in the year when it's the, the summer uh, minimum, basically, you have to say, of the Arctic Sea Ice Extension. And we end sort of in September, which has stretched, thanks to the Arctic Circle Assembly and our sort of final event for this year, um, to October as well. So we have an AC students program now. We do have uh, the AC professionals. And if you keep going, the webinars are the foundation, basically. That's what unifies them. They are all were asked and uh, to uh, submit um, their individual papers. And we decided uh, to take three of them to present the excellent work and research uh, at the Arctic Circle Assembly. You see also the student webinars are an additional component just for the students. And we also are planning to select uh, publications, um, uh, select, yeah, select submissions for publication. We have uh, cooperated with partners such as the World Policy Institute uh, last year already, uh, picking blog posts and, and two topics from our researchers and, and ASC fellows to publish at the Arctic and Context blog, but also we're looking uh, to, to enable uh, a book submission. So that's the next step in 2015. The future, I just want to briefly highlight that because I would love to uh, extend the discussions if possible beyond just uh, the, the topical issues, but sort of how can we contribute to that exchange? Like what role can we play? How do we foster these exchanges with Arctic people in the region? Because that's where it's happening. We have lots of applicants from throughout the world and we can truly claim to be a circumpolar program. But we do have a focus, of course, on Europe and North America uh, with many particip participants from the US and Canada we would like to have it even more circumpolar and even more local to have participants from the Arctic. So one of the Arctic participants for this year actually from Nunavut uh, was only able to participate in a way that we could send her the presentations up front and then she could dial in with a phone because the internet connection was just not fast enough for the live stream of the video content. So we are dealing with technical issues uh, which are just beyond our range just yet. So that's something we want to foster in the future acquire more funds, acquire more communication efforts, and enable more people um, to have actually an exchange, not just about the Arctic, but also with the Arctic. So um, yes, I think that's pretty much it. Just to give an overview why we have these three excellent fellows at this today's session. We focused uh, with our six themed webinars this year on business in the Arctic, research on and in the Arctic, and policies in the Arctic. And we tried to mix it with an international and a local component to cover as broad the policies as possible. 
And so we started off with two webinars on shipping marine governance and renewable energy, which focused a little bit on the business side, the development of, of human interactions in the Arctic. Research on and in the Arctic, we had excellent contributions, uh, what, how science cooperation and communication can actually look like, and environmental impact assessment. And of course, policies in the Arctic on an international level more with a geopolitical, uh, very lawyerish view maybe, uh, but that's, you know, <laughs> we also cater our own interests as well. But, uh, but indigenous communities as well from the local perspective. So why these three today, and the next slide will show, uh, we highlight these two columns of uh, this year's program with these three presentations today. We have Michaela starting off the with her presentation on the climate impacts on, um, on the Arctic, on the region itself, coming from her meteorological point of view. Then taking over by Carol, um, basically showing a little bit about the impacts on indigenous communities. And then Mary's paper finishing the session with um, her, her findings on activities uh, against sexual violence and abuse in indigenous communities. So we try to provide this interdisciplinary exchange which can not only happen in the Arctic Casella College, but that we're proud to enable for years now mm -hmm. to bring together different policy perspectives and expertises <coughs> to bridge the gap in different policy arenas and actually make it a coherent uh, overarching Arctic program. And that's all for me, thank you very much. Thanks to all of our partners. We'll do that at the end of the session as well, but it wouldn't have been possible without the kind support. Conrad Arnold Foundation, and it's already, uh, is represented here. Thank you very much. Uh, but also the WWF International Arctic Program, they support us uh, for years now uh, with funds as well. But that's not just the funding partners, but also our network partners. Without them, we wouldn't be able to reach the same amount of people to apply for the Arctic Summer College. We picked overall uh, just over 20 fellows uh, in the recent years. Uh, but we had more applications and, and only thanks to our sponsors which were able to multiply our reach and range uh, throughout the Arctic community. So thanks to our sponsors and, and they really enable us to do that kind of work and continue. Thank you. Thank you. And that is go straight away to Michaela. Hi, uh, my name is Michaela Duarte and uh, my topic is on changing weather patterns in the face of a melting Arctic. Uh, I am a meteorology undergraduate student at Northland College in the United States. So we'll kind of begin with something I hope you all are familiar with, uh, climate change, especially since you're here at this conference. Uh, it's nothing new. We've all heard about it at some point in our lives. Uh, it's been drilled into our heads for decades. The release of harmful greenhouse gases has been adversely affecting our atmosphere and the Arctic is warming, to put it very simply. <laughs> The Earth is warming and the Arctic as we, know it, as we know it is disappearing. Now, what many of us don't realize is that a melting Arctic has a huge implication on many aspects of worldly life, whether it be uh, biologically, economically, and with social impacts throughout the world. But what about something we see and hear about every single day? What about global weather patterns? Next slide, please. So with global weather patterns, uh, of great importance is that global weather patterns are predicted to change drastically as, re as a result of a changing Arctic. A changing climate in the Arctic is possibly leading to changing weather patterns for the entire globe. This presentation will examine what these changes may be, uh, how they will impact our Earth, and what can be done to learn more about this phenomenon. And at the end, we'll touch, we'll touch on uh, how it impacts specifically indigenous cultures. Now, before we can jump right into, a changing, uh, into changing weather, we need to understand how, uh, the melting taking place in the Arctic and what physical implications this may have. So let's switch gears to the thermodynamic laws of the Arctic. Um, now, as many, as many of you may already know, the last several decades have brought numerous record low sea ice extents and record warm winters in the Arctic. In fact, just this year, we saw another record broken with the, uh, with the lowest wintertime sea ice extent at only 14.52 million square kilometers, which broke the record from last year at 14.54 million square kilometers. Uh, for the year, we also saw the second lowest annual sea ice extent as well. According to NASA data, the lowest 13 extents have happened in the last 13 years. So children born in the 2000s have never known an Arctic where we weren't constantly worrying about second, or setting record low sea ice extents. Uh, the new record low follows record high temperatures experienced across the globe over the last winter. 
This graphic shows that in February of this year, the Arctic was around uh, 11 degrees Celsius warmer, uh, including from the 1951 to 1980 climatology. So a lot of variables have contributed to this equation of a record warm winter, including the impact of an unusually strong El Nino year. As the amount of ice melts, the amount of seasonal uh, ice reoccurrence is, uh, has an inverse effect. The total amounts of ice being able to last more than a year are dwindling, and the thinness of the ice is becoming thinner and thinner. The decreasing amounts of ice are exposing the waters of the Arctic Ocean, and as these waters become exposed, more sun is able to be absorbed in the northern parts of the globe during the Arctic summer. This is due to the sea ice albedo feedback loop. Next slide, please. So as these waters become exposed, more sun is absorbed by the open waters. This is due to the fact that the sea ice has a much higher albedo or ratio of amount of radiation it reflects back into the atmosphere. Um, a typical ocean albedo is approximately 0 0.06, which uh, while bare sea ice varies from approximately 0.5 to 0.7. This means that the ocean reflects only 6% of radiation back to the atmosphere, while the sea ice reflects 50 to 70% of the radiation back to the atmosphere. So it's a drastic change. To put it simply, the sea ice absorbs less solar energy and keeps the surface cooler. Currently, the Arctic is stuck in this vicious cycle between uh, temperature rise, sea ice melt, which leads to surface albedo decrease and ocean absorbing more heat, which leads, leads to temperature rise and the cycle keeps continuing. Next slide, please. So I bet you're asking yourself, well, how, how on earth does this affect weather? Well, how a melting sea ice connects back to weather patterns is through the jet stream. As the Arctic warms, there's less of a temperature gradient or change between the equator and the Arctic itself. This temperature difference is the main driver of the jet stream. As the gradient decreases, the speed of the jet stream follows. A mostly straight path jet stream like the one shown would, move, uh, would cause weather patterns to move in a mostly consistent way. A relaxation of poleward thickness temperature gradients means that there's a weakening of the eastward zonal wind flow, as well as an increase in wave amplitude within the jet stream. In layman's terms, weather patterns will move in a more consistent way in a jet stream that looks like the one pictured versus the one on the next slide. Um, this is what the jet stream is turning into. How a melting sea ice connects oops, versus one that looks like this. Increasing poleward thickness in the poles leads to an elongation of ridges within the jet stream, thus increasing the amplitude of the flow. Higher ridges tend to lead to extreme drought events as it allows for the warmer equatorial air to be brought further north than usual. Um, and deeper trough events hold low pressure systems and this means that there'll be consistent rainfall and more flooding. So uh, a more meandering flow causes the these weather systems to also propagate more slowly eastward, leading towards weather pattern persistence and increased instances of extreme weather across the mid-latitudes. This hypothesized linkage between Arctic warming and a more consistent weather pattern can be supported by observations and model simulations on this slide. A uh, significant decrease in mean zonal winds at the 500 millibar level is shown on this slide. This is about midway through the troposphere, and during autumn, it is observed regionally across the globe. In the first figure, an autumnal 500 millibar zonal wind speed at approximately 43 degrees north, or I think that's around northern Wisconsin where I'm from, is between, 19, or between 1979 and 1994 averages is about 18 to 20 meters per second. Whereas in the graphic on the right, between 1995 and 2003, the averages start to dip down to around 16 to 18 meters per second. This shows that the jet stream could already be starting to slow, starting to change our weather patterns. Next slide, please. So the increased amounts of extreme weather is detrimental to a society as it adds assistance costs and unneeded stress into a community. But these changing weather patterns can have an especially damaging effect to indigenous communities. For centuries, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, and other indigenous peoples and communities have relied on natural resources to sustain their families, communities, uh, ways of life, and cultural identities. Uh, this relationship with both the land and the water makes indigenous people and cultures especially vulnerable to the impacts of changing weather patterns, including drought, increased wildfires, and extreme weather. 
how these communities will be able to adapt will be of utmost importance in their survival. The only real cure to climate change is a switch to a completely renewable energy, but this has proven to be a challenge both economically and politically. In addition to continued investment in renewable energy, uh, research should increase on our atmosphere and its possible links to the Arctic. The relationship between climate change and the jet stream is a very complex one with much to still learn, but that's exactly what science is all about. In the end, the scientific community can benefit from a better understanding of our weather patterns and an increased awareness on the effects of a melting Arctic. Thank you. Thank you. And as you can see, there was a little bit of a trick here because when you heard indigenous peoples, you thought about the indigenous peoples of the north. But in actual fact, with changing weather patterns, they affect indigenous peoples all around the world. Um, so that is something that we need to understand uh, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, but it affects the rest of the planet. So with that, we go on to Carol Devine um, for the indigenous health and climate change in the circumpolar region. So now we go back north. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming today. And uh, I'm really grateful to have done this program with the Arctic Summer College and for the Ecologic Institute. And it was really fun to meet these people because over eight weeks, uh, at lunchtime at work, I would go into an office and they'd go, where are you going, Carol? And I said, I'm doing this course. So it's great to, to meet you and these people live now, my fellow <laughs> fellows. Um, so it was also really interesting to do the course with uh, people of different disciplines and then the presenters from different disciplines because my specialty is health. While it says Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, a medical humanitarian organization, I'm presenting on behalf of the college. But my work in global health informs the presentation. Uh, so, uh, I found this book, it's actually a book called The Caribou Tastes Different, and it's about a hundred testimonies with Inuit elders in Canada who uh, are confirming um, science findings through their uh, storytelling and their experiences. And this one quote in Nain, which is in Labrador in northern Canada where there's indigenous uh, population, oh, go back. Oh. <laughs> um, so. Uh, they also talk about how the berries are different, how there's less um, fat on the bones. But overall, my presentation, I'm going to look at global, global health, and then we're going to zoom in a bit to the, to the Arctic and indigenous populations. I'm not a subject matter expert on indigenous populations, but you'll also find what affects people in Malawi and Southern Africa affects people in uh, the north, and then there are some particularities for sure. It's not a uniform uh, problems or responses. And then I want to highlight a couple uh, innovations because I think it's important to know what people are, are doing. So next slide, please. Uh, no, <laughs> you get to see my whole presentation. The Lancet is a, a big respected medical journal. And I remember in 2009 when they said uh, health is the number one uh, crisis of the 21st century because of climate change. And that was depressing. The number one uh, crisis is, is human health. And then last year, uh, The Lancet published, it's the greatest opportunity of the 21st century. So I'm glad that that was flipped, that that reframing is hopeful. Um, although we have stats that are very worrying about predictions of deaths by 2015. So the real impact on human beings and life, not only what's happening to ecosystems and species. Uh, and the WHO recently published, uh, you know, some hard facts about uh, the clean air, drinking water, things we've known and indigenous peoples have been seeing and testifying and worrying about. Um, now the international bodies are, are catching up. So next slide, please. Uh, I think you're familiar with uh, <laughs> where, where indigenous, I won't go into detail, but uh, for me it was also interesting to see, you know, here are the circumpolar regions, here are the populations, and, uh, you know, Russia has, and also compare health outcomes. So Canada, my country, in the indigenous populations has the worst, uh, has very bad health outcomes and we pay a lot of money. So we're spending a lot and we don't have good enough health outcomes. Um, in four uh, indigenous communities that have Inuit population, uh, have lower life expectancy and higher child mortality. So we have a lot to go. Money is not just the solution. In Russia, uh, the, the least money is spent and there's the worst health outcomes and then you have some middle ground with um, the, the Scandinavian countries where there's some even so the Sami population the indigenous population may have the same outcomes as 
the, uh, the, the southerner population, um, but it'll depend. Mental health might be worse, suicide might be worse. So what I'm saying is there's a big variation. Um, next slide, please. I won't go too much into this, and Michaela fortunately um, talked about some of the, uh, at least from a meteorological and uh, uh, atmospheric circulation issue, but so what, why are we having these health problems now in the Arctic and in indigenous communities? The sea ice, we've seen many graphics at this great um, conference, permafrost, glaciers, uh, and then what's happening to peoples, what's happening to people who live in these lands, um, shifting species, different water. Uh, and steward, a change in stewardship. How are they living on the land? And this is where uh, you know I find it really important that we look at, and again, this is particularly about indigenous communities in the north, uh, and I'm not breaking it down by country, and you'll also see parallels with your own countries and other countries in the world. So food insecurity, obviously, environmental contaminants, what's happening with um, the, the melt uh, and the flooding and it's actually a, a impacting the built environment. Um, Mary will go into more detail about family and sexual violence and violence against women and girls and uh, men and boys, but how does that impact health and well-being? How does that impact security in your community and in your family and mental health and addiction issues? STIs, um, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, when I was at the airport in Nuuk in uh, Nunavut, in Canada's newest uh, indigenous-run um, territory, in the bathrooms, it was all sexually transmitted disease posters. In southern Ontario, we're not seeing that anymore. Um, so it meant it's a public health concern. And then I flew two hours later to Greenland, interestingly, no customs at the airport. Um, again, posters about sexually transmitted infections. So it was telling me, what is the public health concern up here? Tuberculosis, um, we have archaic TB drugs. Um, we're getting better on it, but TB is a big problem in, in the north, across regions, Russia as well, hepatitis B. And then I want to touch a little bit, very quickly, on bacterial diseases. Who heard this summer about what happened with reindeer and anthrax? Okay, so the, the Centers for Disease Control is telling us that 75% of the new re-emerging diseases we're seeing are zoonotic, which means, you'll know, but comes from animals. So it's a big, big concern. So a boy, a 12-year-old Siberian boy, died this summer. Um, and Andy Revkin, if you went to the session about science communication, was saying we need to think differently about different parts of the Arctic. And Siberia has permafrost. So when, a, when an old reindeer thawed, it had anthrax. And they're, they're culling reindeer. So we need to look out for these new uh, re-emerging diseases, um, heart disease, lung disease. Another presenter today from the US uh, Marine um, I forgot, uh, she talked to about um, the health impact of black coal, health and lung disease. So if shipping gets bigger, um, we have to be really careful about uh, how, how we live in the new Arctic and the impact on the local population that will also affect the global population. Next slide. Um, am I going too quickly? Uh, I won't spend too long on this, but it's related to the uh, changing permafrost uh, in Siberia and how that impacts people's lives. We're going to have Climate change and resource extraction impacts lives and um, culture. And I wish there were more open source photos, photos. I wanted to get a newer photo of Nanette's youth, but this is from 2000. So <laughs> interesting about how I urge these communities to <laughs> publish more photos, too. Um, next slide. So now we get into what are we doing about it? So, or how do we do it well? And these are some lessons I've gathered from different groups. But we need financial and human resources. What did we learn from Ebola? that diseases cross boundaries, they don't care about borders, and we need strong health systems. We need a community response. We need to talk to the local populations and leaders about, OK, how are we going to do this? It was a football player who created the Ebola handshake. And that cut down Ebola, because you weren't touching and passing it on. So you know, indigenous knowledge and practices, there's so many good examples. I mentioned tuberculosis. There's a woman here, Shailene Woodward, who said that um, they used to tape to um, to your body, if you uh, were Inuit and you had TB, they would tape your x-ray to your body and put you on a plane and you'd never see your family again. Now, they're training local um, digital x-ray technicians and it's changed, it's changed it all. You don't, it's, it's a much more respectful, uh, better health outcome and we're using technology. Uh, Evidence-based decisions using uh, indigenous indicators that we talked about in another session and obviously collaboration. And I love this picture of this robot. I don't know if any of you heard about Rosie the robot. She was, she, or it, 
was sent to an Aboriginal community in Nain. And long story short, uh, you know, because of where the location was and the weather, sometimes there was no doctor and people would die. So Rosie was an experiment. There was a doctor in a couple communities who would then help resuscitate people, consult. And then Rosie was done. Uh, Rosie was, uh, they were finished the, um, the, the pilot and the community stole Rosie and rebought her. And it shows to me how these communities have agencies, they know what their own needs are and they wanted a doctor, even if it was a doctor in a box. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So I won't spend a long time on this, but I want to say as well as men. So different groups are at risk for different reasons and they're also the solution. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. I want to touch very quickly on three innovations I mentioned. And Mary, being from Alaska, would know more than this than me. But in Canada, we look to this model, the um, South Central Foundation. Is anyone here from Alaska besides Mary? Um, so they, it just keeps coming up as uh, a, health, um, uh, a health leader. And they have this Center for Climate Change and Health. What I like is they do intergenerational training. So they're getting young Indigenous people talking to older. And they also have um, climate mapping and community cameras. So involving local people in their own data searching and then they, they collaborate that's so important with the centers of disease control um, so they're they're to talking to communities to tell what they're seeing and they set up a whole bunch of cameras across the arctic where the community manages the cameras and uh, they talk about contaminated water sources sea ice change uh, and flooding next slide uh, in Greenland, I won't go into too much detail, I mentioned this prevalence of um, sexually transmitted diseases. So here's an innovation where they're doing peer to, it's not original to do peer to peer counseling, but they're getting young people to talk to each other. Because why is there such big STIs? Why are there so many um, uh, early young pregnancies? And I spoke to a Greenlandic woman here, I don't know if any of you went to the session on um, Arctic Innovation Lab, and I asked her, I said, is, is this a problem in Greenland? And she said, there's the thing called um, dark out sex. So the lights are out and you don't know how you're having sex with. So that's, um, you can see why that's a problem. And another gentleman just mentioned in Iceland, there's an app to see if you're related to the person you might be leaving from the bar because it's a small population. <laughs> so those sound <laughs> extreme, but they're innovations to deal with the local problem uh, or challenge. So next slide. And this one, um, I know about circuses an HIV, there's a circus in South Africa called Zip Zap Circus, and in Nunavut they have a circus that um, uh, talks about high suicide rate um, and uh, also is a way to preserve culture. And it, it's said to have mixed um, success, but when it's most successful it's when the indigenous community helps develop it and uh, be part of the circus. So thank you. This interdisciplinary course has been amazing. Everything I think about health, I think about energy, politics, governance, environment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm desperate for an idea to segue over to the next presentation, <laughs> um, which digs much more deeply into the concrete aspects um, of it, and I look forward to it. Mary. Thank you. Mm. So um, Alaska and northern Canada uh, suffer from extremely high rates of sexual assault and domestic violence. Alaska's rate is two and a half times our national average, and the Yukon's rate is four times the Canadian average. Uh, the Northwest Territories is six and a half times the national average, and Nunavut's rate is eight times the national Canadian average. Um, so this is a really it's a really grim topic. I am going to focus on a little lighter um, a lighter perspective on that, and that is looking at slide, please looking at um, local initiatives. Oh, well, I'm not to that slide yet, but okay, I'll get there. Uh, um, I'm gonna focus on local initiatives that aim, that aim at primary prevention, that is reducing the rates of, um, of sexual violence. So, but before I get to that, multiple factors are believed to contribute to sexual and, uh, and um, domestic violence in the North. And these include our colonial histories, and the later rapid socioeconomic change that resulted in trauma that has disproportionately affected um, men and their roles in society. 
And then there are other contextual factors that inhibit social change, and these include the normalization of violence because it's so prevalent, and then a culture of silence that surrounds this violence that includes shaming victims so they don't dare to talk about it. Um, so um, this can be seen, this can be looked at in, um, uh, uh, my approach can be, we can consider climate change um, from the same, sort of the same pers perspective because, uh, next slide please. Uh, back when? Climate change? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that you changed okay. the slides. I'm okay. sorry. So climate change can be really be seen as another exogenous assault on indigenous peoples of the north and their life ways. And again, male roles are likely to be disproportionately affected, heightening the sense of loss of control that contributes to violence, that's sought to contribute to this violence. And so now, as, as well as then, um, locally generated responses will be most effective in responding to climate related changes and maintaining local agency and self determination. Next slide. So, why focus on locally initiated programs to reduce sexual violence and domestic violence? Well, first of all, we can assume that there will be greater credibility and legitimacy with these locally generated pro uh, programs. They're very likely to be culturally relevant and therefore they have the greatest potential for changing social norms and turning around this pattern of uh, high levels of, of sexual violence. Slide. So I'm going to feature some programs that I found that I, I find impressive um, in Alaska in four, uh, four coastal villages in Alaska and each of them represents a coordinated community response, which I think is really essential to, um, to creating the change. Slide, please. But first, before I get into that, I want to mention um, former, a program that former Alaska Governor Sean Parnell initiated in 2009, and it targeted Alaska's epidemic of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child sexual abuse. So he more than doubled funding to prevention and encouraged these community um, marches. In other words, encouraged bringing light to this problem. And so by 2012, more than 120 Alaska communities were holding these annual marches in March um, to, to bring this problem to light. And the Choose Respect campaign may partially explain a significant drop in sexual assault in Alaska in these figures here that you can, that you can see. Slide. So in Barrow, Alaska's northernmost city, the Arctic Women in Crisis are sponsoring numerous outreach programs that promote primary prevention. In other words, uh, attacking the problem before it starts, okay, rather than crisis intervention, which is, tr which is trying to help the victim afterwards. Um, and the focus here is on um, breaking the silence. Slide, please. And so programs that they have sponsored include community cafes, which are guided conversations um, about making communities safer for children. They have introduced the statewide Talk Now, Talk Often program in Barrow that um, guides parents and caregivers in communicating with teenagers about healthy relationships. And finally, they partner with the North Slope School District in providing fourth R healthy relationships prevention curriculum to young children. Slide, please. In Nome, which is a hub on the Seward Peninsula, numerous organizations collaborate. A slide, please. I want to feature the uh, Norton Sound Health Corporation's SANE SART program. So the NSHC secured an Indian Health Service grant a few years ago, and they hired a sexual assault nurse examiner and established a sexual assault response team. And so what SARTs do is they bring together um, trained healthcare providers, victims advocates, and law enforcement officers. And their purpose is to reduce the trauma that victims experience after the assault as they encounter um, authorities and go through medical exams and so on. And the purpose is then to um, increase the, 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 uh, the number, the percentages of assaults that are reported. Well, five years after initiating this program, 
annual reports of assaults in the Nome area had risen 350%. Slide, please. In Bethel, the Tundra, Tundra, Tundra Women's Coalition um, ha initiated 20 years ago a really inspiring program. Slide, please. Um, Teens Acting Against Violence is a student-driven, education-based, anti-violence program whose mission is to reduce dating violence and promote healthy relationships. And in 2013, um, the University of Alaska Anchorage's Justice um, uh, Center did an evaluation of the TAAV, interviewing current and, and uh, former TAAV participants, and they found overwhelming perceptions of the lasting benefits of participation in this program that included um, positive influence on decision-making, self-care, anger management, and healthy relationships. Slide, please. And finally, in the city of Kodiak, um, the um, slide, please. The Kodiak Women's Resource and Crisis Center exemplifies the coordinated community response to reducing domestic and social violence. And so, it collaborates with a number of community agencies um, in doing very in oh in programming in the area schools and in um, in coordinating on various outreach programs throughout the year that build toward the Choose Respect um, March in March. Um, and uh, this fall, they're partnering with the Kodiak High School in, 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 in Alaska's Choose Respect campaign to promote peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. So um, each of these, what I wanted to emphasize with each of these is that, they, is that they do exemplify this coordinated community response, which is essential to maximizing the assets within these rather small communities in the north. Slide, please. So the situation is, is much um, uh, less, or I, I found much less in terms of preventive programming in the Canadian north. Um, and, and I think uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, hindrance to that is that the Canadian North is two and a half times the land mass of Alaska and it has 16% of the population of Alaska and we think we are very sparsely populated, okay, and a, and a hinterland. Well, Northern Canada is a hinterland in the extreme. Um, slide, please. So, um, Health Kuti, Inuit Women for Canada states on its website, mental health has been identified as the primary health issue facing Inuit, including issues related to violence, abuse, unresolved trauma, but the lack of sustained resources has meant that change is painfully slow. Next slide, please. I did find one really promising program, and that is the Yukon's Domestic Violence Treatment Option Court, the DVTO Court. Slide, please. So this program was started in 2000 in response to the Yukon's high rates of domestic violence and the knowledge that a very large percentage of incidents are not reported. Also, because the formal justice systems um, the formal justice system was perceived as quite incompatible with First Nations culture and values. So the DVTO court encourages re, uh, reporting it uh, by providing support and protection for victims and offering therapeutic alternatives that encourage um, batterers to take responsibility. Slide, please. So the DVTO court requires a guilty plea and it includes a 15-week spousal abuse program, um, sometimes other programs, and the sentences are usually community-based. An independent evaluation of the DVTO and SAP program concluded that they are very effective and that they provide an excellent model for addressing spousal abuse and spousal assault and abuse. And the study found that recidivism rates for domestic violence offenses were impressively low. 12 months after completing the program, 9% of DVTO clients had reassaulted, and in general, 30% recidivism in this group is, is average. Um, next slide, please. I, I did find a couple of promising uh, Canadian research projects that are focused on developing um, uh, some models for uh, community-based um, responses to um, 
to sexual assault. And the second one I mentioned here is, is youth-oriented um, through social media. But in the interest of time, I'll just move on to the next to my conclusions on the next slide. And um, so my conclusions are that breaking the silence and focusing on primary prevention is essential to reducing the uh, incidence of sexual assault in the North. And changing norms will require local initiative, human assets and fiscal resources, co uh, coordinated community efforts to maximize community strengths, and persistence. And programs that, eng uh, that engage youth I actively, I think, show the most promise, partly because young people can still create their own narratives and because changing the norms among young people will brighten their own lives and those of future generations. And so just as a final remark, um, in combating the academic ra epidemic rates of sexual violence in the North, as in responding proactively to climate change, local agency and local initiative are critical to promoting community well-being and to maximizing self-determination. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, all the presentations will be uploaded on the Arctic Summer College website. So if you want to uh, later on find out in the details, but we will reduce the, um, the resolution of the images because otherwise it just takes too long to download them. Uh, we want to make it uh, easy. What we've seen here is an attempt to um, uh, look at the big picture of global environmental change, um, overheating and the changing of the weather patterns, and what it means for individual people in individual communities. And that is, in a way, what the, um, the ambition of the um, Arctic Summer College is, to bridge the scales, the disciplines, the language areas, um, and, and really do that is in, in a circumpolar um, uh, community that is not quite circumpolar. We have gaps in that, in that circle that we want to close. But there you see that, that ambition. And um, if you have comments, if you have questions, please raise your hand and prepare to say who you are, to whom you are direct, um, address the comment or the question, and then um, ask it. Any comments, questions? Be free to speak up loudly so the microphone can pick it up here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Herbert Beck. I'm the German ambassador to Iceland. And thank you very much. And I think it's, it's an extremely interesting approach uh, which you are following, and um, and I say that not only as the German ambassador, and uh, <laughs> and I know that the Eco Institute is in Berlin and the uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, <laughs> but I, I think it is, uh, and I think uh, one can prove that because there's no Germans, so to speak, who uh, who presented anything uh, in, in in terms of, of, of content. Um, I have one question when when you, uh, um, uh, Professor um, Erlander, sorry, yeah, uh, when, when you when you. Uh, um, uh, compared the situation between the United States or, uh, uh, and, and, and Canada mm -hmm. uh, concerning the pe penal uh, aspect of, uh, of, of abuse and, uh, and, other, and, and you said that in Canada also with, with that court, uh, court uh, project that, um, uh, let's say, um, procedures which are more indigenous uh, procedures of, of dealing with, uh, with um, uh, crim criminal mm -hmm. uh, Activities uh, have been uh, taken a, 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 so to speak, a local or, a, or an indigenous way also of dealing mm -hmm. with that and, 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 and penalize people also right. who have, uh, have um, um, uh, acted uh, criminally. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the same in, 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 in uh, Alaska or is the US law, so to speak, uh, applied to all those cases in, uh, in the US uh, differently? Or is there a space, so to speak, for more local? Uh, legal traditions, uh, is there a difference between Canada and, uh, and the United States? So um, we share so much um, uh, of our histories uh, and our current conditions and challenges in Canada and Alaska, and particularly northern Canada and Alaska. And so just to um, um, as to your question, we, d we do have something, uh, we do have certain um, sort of therapeutic, they're called therapeutic court models in Alaska. Um, I didn't feature that. It, it, it relates more, as I understand it, to um, alcohol offenses. Um, they use therapeutic courts. Also, 
uh, for instance, for um, people who are known to be affected by fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, um, people, in other words, who are not fully responsible for their own actions. Um, but this idea of the incompatibility between, um, between the mainstream Western judicial system and, um, and indigenous values, um, perhaps I could just explain a little bit about that and then maybe all of that would make more sense. So, um, so in indigenous communities, um, there tends to be more uh, of, a, of a desire to um, resolve the problem and have forgiveness and have um, 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 the, I don't know what the word, I've, I've yeah. lost the word, but it's um, reconciliation. Exactly, reconciliation, um, so that the community can move forward again because communities are very, very small. And so, um, as for instance, sentencing circles are a traditional way to do this where victim and and perpetrator face one another and even family members might talk with one another about the harms done and how this has harmed the whole family. The, 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 so that's seen as a more traditional way to deal with problems. With the Western approach that um, law enforcement kind of in Alaska, for instance, swoops in, arrests people, they disappear, and that person arrested is probably the family provider and so then that person disappears for who knows how long. That's not seen as an effective solution to the problem in the community. And therefore, many women in Alaska and, and in Canada will say, well, I don't want to get him in trouble. I just want him to stop, you know, I just want him to stop hurting me. Um, and so people, so women and, uh, and boys and girls, oftentimes don't report the crimes because they don't want to get the perpetrator in trouble. They just want him to stop. And so, and so um, that's why these community-based solutions and um, therapeutic court that address the problem that the perpetrator has, oftentimes it's alcohol-related, um, are thought to be more effective and uh, more appropriate. Does that does that yeah. help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it's it's known as truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That is yes. establish the facts and exchange that make it public, so yes. that the um, it's the visibility of the crime and of the perpetrator as well as the victim, um, and that then enables um, reconciliation or yes. um, uh, uh, somehow a continuity in, yes. in the community. And it, it works at different scales. Mm -hmm. It works among families, but it also works mm -hmm. amongst nations. Um, the whole program is uh, Mandela's uh, approach to mm -hmm. uh, healing the, the harm after apartheid, right. which was the same type of violence, differently motivated, but at a, at a much larger scale. Which so it works out, for example, in the, the yeah. genocide mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. reconciliation. So this, it is a pattern that obviously seems to work at scale, um, but it also means that here is a community-based approach to finding justice. Mm -hmm. And the concept of justice and the concept of punishment um, is completely different to yeah. our Western legal tradition. And that is something that um, I think is important to bring out so that the Western legal norms that are uh, transported into these areas become tolerant and accepting of those community traditions. And that's actually not easy to do. Uh, and I say that as an engineer, but there you are. <laughs> Who are you? And That's a very big, that's a very big question. I don't think I don't think that we have enough evidence uh, to make any kind of a broad statement about that. Um, however, um, um, in general, there seems and my, it's my understanding, and I and I should state if it's not entirely obvious by my pure white except it's pink right now face that I am not um, I am not. Alaska Native, I am a native Alaskan. I was born there, but I am not an indigenous, I'm not indigenous of Alaska, so I feel a little, um, I feel almost like I need to clarify that before, and I can't speak for, I certainly can't speak for Alaska Natives, but 
it is my understanding that um, that in general people within small communities want their do want their communities to heal they don't want huge disruptions and it's the and in fact um, fear of disruption is part of the reason is a huge part of the reason that um, victims are silenced they 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 know they mustn't cause trouble and so that's why they they don't even dare to say what has happened to them so they internalize it um, so so I presume that rev that that um, reconciliation in the terms of having in terms of having the harm done to them acknowledged at least mm -hmm. instead of having themselves blamed mm -hmm. would be much much better mm -hmm. and yet still having the providers and actually loved ones remain in the community I mean that's how complicated it is these are oftentimes loved ones who are doing this so um, so I presume that that is a uh, that's a preferred solution I just wanted to add, I would be amiss, you asked about Canada. I can't also respond. Um, I don't know if we have an Aboriginal Canadian woman in the room, I think so. No, no. Oh, Greenlander. 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 Mm -hmm. um, would you like to say something? Yeah, well, um, you are saying that's correct, at least um, uh, some, some girls and women do not like uh, like their uncles or if providers to to be shared and it hurts the, the other family mm -hmm. so yeah but some girls they want they don't want to meet me yeah. uh, at the local store or something like that but um, yeah it's difficult it's difficult yeah mm -hmm. And I just, thank you so much. I wanted to add about about Canada, uh, the, the penal system. I mean, a big problem, maybe you've heard about it, the missing and Aboriginal women. It's a big, big issue in Canada um, where in the northern communities and indigenous communities, but also in the rest of Canada, um, and I can't comment on any other country, but women just fear going to the police because there's such a low... Um, rate of uh, convictions. So mm -hmm. to comment on the penal system, we actually have to get to the situation where women w want to report um, and feel that there will be some kind of fair justice. Mm -hmm. so. Good. This, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, Philip Robinson, uh, University of Iceland. Professor, mm -hmm. start with you touched on uh, how climate change has increased the incidence of sexual assault and violence. Um, I, I wonder if you're going to go into more detail on, on the directness of that link. Um, and the ways in which that link is also indirect within the treatment. Okay, I'm glad you asked because because I did not mean to give just that impression. The reason that I link the two is that um, it's very, um, it, I mean, virtually everyone who studies these issues agrees that colonialism and, uh, followed by, which continues actually, uh, but followed by more recent rapid socioeconomic change has um, caused trauma and destabilized indigenous communities and indigenous individuals with multi-generational effects. And these changes were brought about by outsiders, so they're exogenous change being imposed upon um, indigenous communities. And these changes and this instability has um, absolutely much disproportionately affected men and so because women's roles as mothers and as nurturers and providers have remained the same even as they have entered modern society and gotten um, western education and taken on jobs their central roles as mothers and nurturers have remained exactly the same whereas for men their roles as um, as family and community providers have changed enormously and so and and so uh, and it's very unclear to many indigenous men these days and young men exactly how should they prepare themselves for the future it's it's entirely uncertain and so it's this sort of instability and uncertainty that many people think uh, contributes to um, internalized anger that sometimes 
um, explodes, especially in combination with alcohol abuse. Okay, now let's switch to climate change. And climate change is again an exogenously, you know, exerted change on communities that creates all kinds of uncertainty. Again, it's men's roles that are going to be as hunters and providers that are going to be affected disproportionately. And so here again, we have this uncertainty and and any ability to to do what on earth can you do about it if you you know when one individual do about it, and so, and so I am making that link um, and thinking that well actually it's going to be really so that we don't have further trauma um, um, uh, caused to communities, and I think that it's very important that local communities take the initiative use their own agency to respond proactively to the inevitable climate change so that there isn't further trauma and a worsening of um, these conditions that um, uh, appear to cause um, men to um, act out in, in violence. Mm -hmm. okay, um, just coming back to the role of men and uh, I was posted, my last posting was in South Africa, and I mean, there is exactly the same problem among black uh, communities, that also there is the, the question of the role of mm -hmm. men in, uh, in the society. And uh, taken that uh, it is very difficult also to, to get people, uh, to get men back to their traditional roles as hunter and gatherers, mm -hmm. um, I mean, is there a discussion, or how can the discussion be shaped to find a new role model, what would be an appropriate role of men in um, in in, um, in the region in order to give them back their dignity, their uh, self confidence, their um, income, uh, whatever, also to make them, so to speak, uh, um, a person who doesn't have to resort to violence, to 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 alcohol or whatever it is, so to speak, uh, um, making li life in in those communities difficult and So I feel sort of bad to be doing all the talking here. I'm wondering <laughs> if you, if maybe you well, I have you something you might want to contribute from your own. I just wanted. I just came from a session um, uh, with uh, a woman named uh, Alice Ogilvie. No, Elizabeth Ogilvie. There were two women named Ogilvie, and she's a Scottish artist who works on the Arctic. And she ha was, is interviewing men in Greenland, or people in Greenland, about the sea ice change. And it's a beautiful art exhibit. And there was a really moving passage that addresses your question, and not saying all men <laughs> who are impacted by climate change are, of you know, you. are. Um, but what made me think about what's, what's driving depression and what's driving, um, uh, what's driving difficulty in wh wh what is my role and who am I for men, women, in his words, um, he said that he used to, and this was James Bellogue's film also was being shown, so just the massive changes to the sea ice. Uh, he said that where, it, where, there was, where they used to go dog sledding, and you guys know the story, where there was dog sledding and where they would go ice fishing, and with the, where they'd go out on the land, it's now water. So you've got increased drownings. But he said, I don't know how to share what I do with my son. So that was really powerful to me. Like, you know, but... There, I don't know, it's like, how do we say what they should do next, right? But I think um, it's a very critical time uh, for, uh, for, for, for men and for, for young people who are saying, but there was a UPIC study who said, those youth who, have, who identify with a more traditional way of life have less psychological stress and are happier and lower suicide rates. So there is something about this these examples of mm -hmm. intergenerational discussions and finding a way to still talk about tradition. So it doesn't really answer your question, but... <laughs> I oh, may I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, just if I can follow up on that, I think yeah. it's also the, the influx of, of different business opportunities in different countries. So if there's a mine coming in, a mining company providing maybe their own workforce as well from other countries. So it's just with a, with a small scale of communities, the influx of just the 50 or 100 people can easily change the whole setting per se and then it's so the changing opportunities from climate change might not always actually bring all the benefits to the local communities but to businesses operating in the region so that's really the question of the 
financial benefits at least stay in the region if not actually the workforce can be you know schooled or um, you know receive some sort of education that they could provide or profit from that as well so i think it's really the 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 changes in the, the climate changes affect local communities in this regard and, and traditional role models in that regard that it's not just um it's not one replacing one business with the other that's just uh, yeah won't be possible mm -hmm. You want well, to add I, yeah, I was I was just going to say that it's it's well recognized that um, that um, young native Alaska native. Um, by the way, if there are Canadians in the audience, uh, we use the the term native. It's not disparaging in Alaska. It's used with um, with respect and with pride among Alaska natives. And so um, I hope that my use of that term doesn't offend anybody. It's totally natural for me, and it's hard for me n not to say it in this context. So um, anyway, um, uh, so it's well recognized that there aren't enough um, strong uh, male role models who can offer uh, young men, uh, young Alaska Native men, uh, um, a vision for how how would I just how would I pursue this you know this kind of a lifestyle how would I be successful if I wanted to pursue a traditional lifestyle and the fact is <coughs> most or many want to do both I mean everybody wants some wage income now you have to have it you can't live nowadays without a wage income but there aren't enough strong uh, there aren't enough strong uh, role, male role models, and this is not at all to say that, of course, that that you know even the majority of of, uh, of indigenous Alaskan men are are perpetrating this kind of violence. Not not at all. But it, but it is a it's a pervasive problem, and it and it and it really is um, it's a devastating problem. But it but it is it is more a problem uh, that, that rapid changes have 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 just struck. Uh, men more profoundly and and harmed and done more harm towards men and and women seem to have been more more flexible in taking on the more recent opportunities while maintaining their identities as women and um, mothers and so on. Hi, my name is Diane Joseph. I work for the U.S. Department of Transportation. If you don't mind me taking a conversation and just sort of addressing all the questions mm. from the two of us. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> also, also an oh, AC fellow for this year's program. I was a fellow this year and had a great experience learning from the diverse new panelists as well as the diverse new <coughs> students, so I'm very excited. So a question a little bit about the interdisciplinary nature of the Arctic. As a meteorologist, what can climate scientists do to better integrate their science into other s social sciences? So for example, in this discussion, what can meteorologists do to better influence the work of healthcare specialists, um, agriculture work, et cetera, and then what can climate scientists do to make that link for the rest of the world back to the United States? I think the number one thing they can do is just getting their message out there, awareness, something that uh, they can say to the public and the public will absorb and then, you know, it'll, like, if they can get their message about how climate change can affect health, like, climate change warming has in has a uh, pollution effects on the globe and that inversely has effects on people's lungs and increased amounts of asthma if they can get that information to health specialists they can help them uh, better prepare themselves for that and engaging with these uh, smaller communities on ways that they can adapt is something that uh, will be helpful. I read a news article about uh, a community, I don't remember the name of the community up in Northern Alaska, but they're having to move their entire community because of like flooding due to climate change. And so having climatologists that could be up there to help them move to a location that's gonna weather the weather uh, is definitely helpful for them and then like I said just getting their message out there in any other way through publications through increased uh, research through increased funding any way possible just to get their message out there
Mm -hmm. But then it's not denied the fact that gender trauma was not only violence against mm -hmm. women involved, um, and it's it's a huge huge problem. But I guess my question is, sorry, keep going. Can this um, can we address these two issues separately, or do they have to be together? And really, is it up to the state to address it, or does it have to be does it have to be a grassroots community-based um, solution? But really, should be like I know. Um, I'm sorry, could you clarify? Yeah. Oh, I think Anna got the question. No, we'll just, yeah. no, we'll just actually add on to that question because we just went towards like what can we provide because we provide so far exchange of external experts on Arctic issues. And um, so, you know, something to provide communication and provide exchange where it's, you know, it's clearly we, we're focusing on a very local issue which mm -hmm. is impacted by global changes. Um, but, it's, but it seems to me also that the focus of tackling these issues is usually grassroots based, community based. So where would you see an angle? So just follow up, like wh how can we, where would, at which point could be external experts helpful? Because uh, we've seen telemedicine, you know, where you have sometimes external expertise just outside of the community, which is just not, they sometimes somebody like an expert or a consultant or somebody who's actually listening to people and their stories might not be available or j they won't have the funding to fly mm -hmm. 4,000 kilometers north. Uh, so we, how can how can digital exchange support these local communities to support their own ways of development? So it's really, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, so, so I wondered if I could just have a clarification though. You said, can we address these two problems together or do, did I, 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 I Can we address suicide and sexual assault together? Is that what you're asking? No, by oh. approach she means like could, um, should the local community deal with oh. it or should okay. outside or both? Oh, okay, okay. So, so, so I actually come to the conclusion that what we need is the local expertise and the local initiative coupled with outside um, both expertise and resources because in these small communities in the north, especially in the Canadian north, there simply aren't the, the, the um, fiscal resources to provide such programming. And for instance, now um, there have been these um, import, uh, really promising studies done by outside, um, by outside organizations that are finding, you know, that are developing, you know, research-based solutions and that are discovering what are common common problems throughout uh, northern Canada or throughout which also the same almost the same conditions exist in rural Alaska and so and so I do think very very much that we have to have that combination of outside uh, resources and um, and expertise in terms of uh, uh, research uh, research and then coupled with though, the local, there has to be that impetus coming from within, and it has to be locally generated responses that are, um, that then will be culturally relevant, for instance, and will have that legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's absolutely essential that you have the outside working with the inside to, to have success. And I, I would echo that. I would just say also you want, you want leadership too, right? So when you have those leaders, whether they're from the southern government or local government, that really helps. I would say it should really be integrated. And of course, the cultural appropriate, but absolutely need the resources. Mm -hmm. And I think the last intervention comes from you. Yeah, and my name is Ika. I'm from South India. I'm studying culture and society history at the university. Can you speak up a little more? And finally, uh, this time of yeah, this time we get to see local people um, doing the initial or we get help from outside to um, heal ourselves kind of uh, because it has always been like this that 
someone comes from outside and say you have to do this and that, mm-hmm. and it never works. Mm-hmm. So I'm touching that finally um, we we can do it in our own way. Mm-hmm. Kind of. okay. mm-hmm. We can help from the outside. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that statement. Is there anything you would like to add in response before I close? There doesn't seem to be anything. No question have come <laughs> through the social media. <laughs> Not <Thank> really. <laughs> so um, I think that has given you a picture of what we try to do with the um, Arctic Summer College. Um, it is mainly outsiders. Um, or some southerners who have moved to the north um, that are engaged in it. Uh, we had uh, participation by indigenous peoples um, from the north, but it has been very difficult for a number of reasons. One is the summer colleges during the summer, and they tend to be not at the university during the summer, but um, in their home places where they do not have internet access. Uh, they may not actually be in their homes, but they may be out in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's simply the, the routine of organizing it according to the academic summer calendar just doesn't fit them. Um, but beyond that, even those who were willing uh, could not participate basically because there's a lack of bandwidth. Um, and m- my wish would be that somebody would sponsor us um, um, uh, some satellite um, telephones mm-hmm. with strong yeah. bandwidth mm-hmm. so that we could actually have a sort of not a lottery but a competition by eligible. Uh, young people from the communities and they would not only be able to participate in the summer college but they would also get a piece of kit that is valuable mm-hmm. um, all day round so to speak mm-hmm. um, and it may actually be useful for the community as a whole as a way of engaging more with the people that um, uh, ev- obviously everybody here in the room uh, cares about we'll see how that goes um, uh, the practical next step is always uh, there will be a book uh, so beyond all that but I also want to say something else and that is um, Anna said that we have 104 people in the community. They are former um, Arctic Summer College um, fellows who remain in the community. Now, Facebook does track uh, group activity and related to size. And I can tell you that these 104 people are an absolute outlier in Facebook statistics concerning activity. And likes don't count as activity. It's mm-hmm. only a comment mm-hmm. that counts as activity in that context. So it is an enormous thing. We use Facebook as a communication exercise, and it works fantastically. You throw a question into that, and you get responses. You get sources. You can say, how do we know that? And then at some point, people take it offline. They say, well, let's, let's meet or let's telephone, and then eventually a publication comes out of that. It's that sort of community, and that is not conveyed. The intensity is not conveyed by the number 104. Um, uh, and what we now have is at the, big, the beginning of, I would say it is systema- systematized anecdotes that tell us that the whole program is actually career accelerator. Going mm. through the program of the Arctic Circle Assembly and seeing how many names we know because they are <laughs> former fellows tells us something about the fact that being engaged in the community is actually um, uh, very helpful uh, to them. Beyond that, I think uh, we focused very much on one link, and that is climate change, adding to the disruption that is experienced by the northern mm-hmm. communities. And I think we explored this, possib- uh, this, this, this view that, yes, men perpetrate the violence against women, but it's the men who are also victims mm-hmm. of changes. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not perpetrators, mm-hmm. but it means that there is an issue that we have to deal with that is beyond um, the traditional uh, understanding of uh, crime prevention or uh, um, uh, law enforcement afterwards. The complexity is enormous, and I hope we made a contribution here uh, towards uh, discussing this more. But there are some more things that need to be thought through um, when we want to understand uh, the relationship between climate change and health and indigenous uh, communities. Uh, You mentioned the uh, unfrozen anthrax, and Mm -hmm. we don't know how many um, places there are that will happen, and we don't know how many other disease vectors there are will be unfrozen or that will migrate north with the changing weather patterns, um, new insects carrying diseases to the north or a- other animals. Um, uh, all these things, they will put pressure onto the health systems in those communities and in many cases the traditional knowledge in the communities will not uh, provide them with the means um, uh, to fight that. And the same can be said 
I think about changes in diet that are induced by a southern lifestyle moving north, um, uh, sometimes only by providing um, for the diet of the uh, people who go from the south to the north to work on construction site or in the mines yeah. or in the transport sector, but it has an effect on the mm -hmm. local diets and can have um, uh, uh, an impact both on the roles of men and women, um, because a lot of the community is about food, but also it can have an impact on um, the physical health by uh, changing the diet. Those are things we have not explored today, but they are things that perhaps we'll explore next year, depending on what interests the fellows have that um, will apply. So you've learned about this. Um, I hope that you took away some ideas on the substance. I hope that um, you've learned enough about the Arctic Summer College to either apply yourself or encourage others to apply next year round. I think the competition will start again in, in April or something. April um, or early May, yeah. yeah, that's usually. So watch this space. It goes out through various social media as well as on the um, um, uh, uh, website as well as um, our partner organizations tend to advertise this as well. It, it gets, word gets out, don't worry about that. And I thank you very much for your interest and I thank you very much for the input that you've prepared for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I had all those examples. I think we can have time. That was amazing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.